From the heart of Manhattan, this is Classic Talk. Thank you for joining us on Classic Talk with Bing and Dennis. Today we are very happy to welcome Gerald Finley into the studio. Gerald, a Canadian baritone who is currently singing Don Giovanni, the title role at the Metropolitan Opera. Welcome, Gerald. Thank you very much. Lovely to be here. Thank great. you for spending some time with us. Oh, it's great. Let's start at the very beginning. <laughs> We'd like to know, you're Canadian, so you... Yes, absolutely. From? from uh, born in Montreal. Uh, I was there until I was uh, nearly eight years old, and then I moved to Ottawa, or, or as I now say, Ottawa, <laughs> 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 because after I lived in Ottawa for, uh, uh, for well, about about 11 years, I went to England to study. But my main, the main part of my initial sort of upbringing in the music was, uh, was in Ottawa um, as a boy chorister. Mm -hmm. So uh, you boy soprano? Boy soprano and did those famous boy soprano things like beginning carol services with Once in Royal David City and singing the youth in Elijah for the local choral society. Were you ever a mall and a mall and night visitors? You know, it's funny. I, I grew up with that record, funnily enough. Um, I can't remember who was singing on it, but uh, and I missed that. I mean, I always remember, is it Casper? Who was I saying? I never, tra was, ne yes, I yeah, never travel. travel without my box. You mm -hmm. know, that's a <laughs> great quote of all time. But um, uh, no, a mall I missed out on. I had the pleasure of singing that Did once you? upon a time. Did you? Good for you. Yes. Good for you. Yes. Why is it usually a uh, soprano, you know, the, the core, always turning to baritone? <laughs> That's it. Well, it is interesting, isn't it? I, well, I think it's, it's probably a percentage thing. You know, I think uh, there must be sopranos who turn into tenors. Um, actually, one of the famous uh, British, uh, what I would call, uh, current tenors is... Um, was uh, or is called Alec, um, Alad, Alad Jones, and he sang some a lot of very famous things in um, uh, in the UK in the in the 1980s. And I actually appear on a on a video with him. He's singing all the, the wonderful treble things, and I sing excerpts from uh, some other carols and things. And it's with pictures from the Metropolitan Opera Museum, uh, Metropolitan Museum here of. Uh -huh. uh, of Christmas tapestries and things like that, but he turned into a tenor. So it, oh. it does happen. He, he sang uh, he sang many things uh, very famously as a boy treble. But the rest of us, I I must think that that a lot of the tenors that we know must have sung treble. They just don't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably true. When when did you stop singing? I mean, voice change. Yeah. Well, I was. I was a late changer. It was I was nearly sixteen. Is that right? Is that yeah, right? Yeah, and and being being fifteen and three quarters and still in your boys' choir, while everyone else is in the bass or tenor section, and you know wanting to play hockey after school and doing all those things that normal mid teenagers want to do, and I was going to boys' choir practice. So I, I think a lot of <clears throat> I handled myself. In an extremely mature way, I just and I tried to talk down here <laughs> a lot. Yeah, you know, I'm off to choir practice. Right. Like, what? <laughs> but I survived, and uh, it eventually turned into a baritone, a very very narrow baritone. I didn't know, I couldn't sing low and I couldn't sing high uh -huh. for about two or three years. But I struggled on. I struggled on, and overall, in the end, it was um, I I got into some choirs when I was 17 and 18, mm. and that helped me. I was with, right. with my own kind then. Are you from a musical family? Well, no, um, not not in the immediate uh, vicinity. My you have a cousin who's play, who plays. Yeah, well, you. yes, my cousin is a is a was a concert pianist oh. and uh, now runs a festival in in Ontario in mid Ontario called West Bend. Mm -hmm. His name's Brian Brian Finley, in fact. And I have another cousin actually who, um, in my dad's side, who was a rock drummer. <laughs> and uh, so he had music definitely and also in his family there was another pianist of sorts but I've also found recently and this is kind of the fun bit where my father's aunt um, was in fact somebody called Lorraine Noel Finley and she did translation for Shermer in Italian opera arias so Isn't all right? the all it's those anybody who has an Italian opera anthology with English translation, they'll see 
Lorraine Finley as the translator. And she was in she was here in New York, very involved in the um, amateur music scene and the choral music scene in in the thirties and forties. She married a, a violinist and retired to Connecticut and there she is. I mean she's a direct a direct uh, relative and I can't believe it. <laughs> right. So sure. my aunt was was you know and it, and she has a whole archive now in the um in uh, the Eastman School up in Rochester. Is that right? So oh, yeah. she was a composer as well. So there is music mm -hmm. in the line somewhere. Your parents were supportive of your singing? Well, you know, naturally, being good conservative Canadian, <laughs> uh, they were very much uh, keen that I should further myself in things like sciences and perhaps even medicine. What did your um, dad do? Well, my dad was a was a professor of education. He mm -hmm. uh, he he had an amazing career. He had a uh, a life as an accountant. He uh, became very studious and uh, lectured in uh, the history of education. And then he became a civil servant in Ottawa. That's why we moved to Ottawa in the museums and was responsible for looking after things like um, uh, all the ethnic uh, displays and, and transporting of original log cabins into the museum spaces and things like that. So he had a he had a keen interest on. So what did he foresee things. that you should be? Well, actually, he was pretty cool. Uh, he was, very, I mean, cool in a in a in the positive way. It, in, he was relaxed about. He knew that I very much liked music. It was him who encouraged me to do the boy treble thing. Um, he he was very supportive of that. Drove me. To every single choir practice practically oh. collected me. We, you know, I was there three or four times a week, often, and um, until I learned to drive, he was he was my transport. Um, and it was true. I mean, I I have said that my family wasn't musical. It was through a, a war injury that he was unable to sing anymore. Mm -hmm. um, he had he had a shrapnel wound in the, in his head, which paralyzed him on his left side. But that meant he lost his balance and also his his singing voice. He had been a singer, oh. uh, as a treble, and uh, uh, apparently a good dancer. Oh. Uh, so my mom oh. says. And <laughs> then, um, uh, but because of the injury, he he may he loved opera. We had music in the house, you know, playing over meal times and things like that. Uh, so his interest was very keen, and though I never saw the practical side of it. Do you remember that your dad would tell you something like? Any given moment that we say, okay, fine, you like music, but you still need a real job. Something like that, do you remember? Or, uh, well, no, I kind of took that out of his hands because when I, I, I was involved in music competitions in Ottawa, and when my voice changed, um, it took me a year or two to get into the competitions again I, after I'd been them as, as a treble. And so when I won the adult solo classes um, there. He was there and uh -huh. he saw that it was going pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, he was very aware that the support needed um, both uh, morally and financially um, needed to be steady. And uh, But he consulted some of his relatives who, who Again, we're aware of what the music business was like, particularly an uncle of mine who, who was again married to another aunt, um, <laughs> who was the West, uh, who was the organist at Westminster Abbey, mm -hmm. and he knew the music scene in England very, very well, mm -hmm. and it was actually through that connection that my sort of initial steps began on the British training. Um, although I did go to Ottawa University and mm -hmm. spent a year there just picking up harmony and. Boy, doing Bach uh, <laughs> chorales and doing stuff like that. So Hard you didn't work, have to convince him at all. I mean, you sort of he was, I, I don't know, he was pretty laid back about mm -hmm. it. Uh -huh. My mom freaked out. Really? She, I mean, she just knew that, that this was not the profession that she could see her son doing. <laughs> um, because she was worried about, sure. you know, the financial security of it. Naturally, the parents want their children to be solidly... Uh, grounded and I don't blame her for worrying mm -hmm. um, she just said well why don't you just get your degree first in you know in the chemical in your in your chemistry your biochemistry and then you can you know and you can do music and I said no no I really need to feel that I can 
right. pursue this and see how far I could go. It was to be a choral conductor. That was my ambition. I didn't oh. think my voice was going to be good enough, but I thought I'd use the voice to become a choral conductor. And when I, because it seemed both here in the United States mm -hmm. and in Britain, and I'd grown up in it in Canada, of course, the environment for choral music seemed to be very vibrant. And, it, and as a professional, too, you felt that there was that real potential where you could be a choir director or a professional singer, um, even a concert promoter or an organist or right. something like that. So, Did you study piano as a kid? Oh, you know, that was my big, big regret. That, of all the things, I think that if I were a stronger parent now, <laughs> I would insist on those piano lessons actually happening. I said, no, Mom, I'm never going to use it. I won't practice. It's ridiculous to try and force me to do it. I did take a few when I was sort of 15 and 16, but by then, I don't know what it is. Teenagers, the concentration span isn't there, and the fingers seem to be like rocks at the end of your hands. And <laughs> I found it really hard. I still find it hard. I can just about get through a score now very, very slowly, and I can play my own line, of course. But as an accompanist, I'd be... You know, I give up on the first page. When so, did she start to turn around to really say, okay, he is really on his way? Oh, I think, you know, there was that, uh, that moment when she, well, when I got into King's College, Cambridge, which is obviously a fantastic choir, and she heard the, the worldwide broadcast on Christmas Eve that they do every year, and she heard that I was part of that. And then from that, you know, I was starting to get work um, as a professional chorister, which actually funded all, all, all my further training for, for a number of years in London. She realized that there was a profession to be had there. And um, they visited me in Cambridge and saw that there were many people who had careers as, you know, as choristers and, and, and involved in the church music scene. So I think she, uh, she was, she was, Reluctantly agreeable to uh, to my path at that. I stage. think at that point probably she thinks her star is born. Well, perhaps, <laughs> perhaps, perhaps. So when did the direction change from chorus work towards solo, say, operatic? Yeah. Work? Well, pretty soon after Cambridge, actually, after I'd done my three years at King's Cambridge, um, I had had the best of all worlds in the choir. You know, it is a really professional situation there. We recorded three as it was, albums a year. Um, we went on tours all the way. We went to Australia. We went to, um, where else did we go? Um, uh, New Zealand. And there were, you know, television specials being going on. I felt I was absolutely a professional choir person. And as soon as I left, I thought, oh, heck, uh, being a professional chorister is always going to mean some compromise now. It was never going to be as satisfying a choral experience as I had there. So I thought, well, let's see how the solo singing can go. And a number of my friends at the time were also doing it. In fact, a very good colleague, Simon Keenly side, I knew at Cambridge. At the same time. At That's the right. same time. And, uh, and he was going off to Manchester to study. And there I was going off to London to study. And, you know, it, it seemed to be a common, common enough thing to want to pursue. And there was always the fallback that you could earn a living in the professional choirs in order to either support yourself or at least, and some people stayed, you know, a long time. But I immediately knew I wanted to be on stage. So you went to London, went to what used to be called the London, the opera school, is that the same? I first went to the Royal College of Music mm -hmm. and did a three year thing, two, um, two years in the opera school there and one year as a, just a normal postgraduate. So I was kind of getting on. I, I liked the idea of being in school. It seemed to be a comfortable <laughs> place not to have to make a living. Um, safer. It was safer. And I still felt I wasn't quite ready. You know, it was one of those things I never... There were so many wonderful singers around and people who seemed to be ready to, you know, win competitions and go off into there. And I still felt I wasn't quite settled. I, you know, as I said, my voice was late changer. It still felt like I was still vulnerable in a way. Um, I still was singing a little bit like I did in the choir. A little bit on the throat, just a <laughs> bit sort of under-supported. 
it took me a long time to really feel secure that I could become a soloist. And I then left that college scene and got into the chorus at Glyndebourne oh. and um, had a year there. And then I went to the National Opera Studio, partly as a result of having been in the chorus. I think they, they saw perhaps a potential there. But it was actually then that I stopped thinking that I could be a singer. I had a kind of a year, year and a half where I went back to that baritone that only had that very narrow range. I loved my song singing, and I, but I had no strength. I had no thing. I tried to sing Messiah, which isn't too, it is a demanding role, but, but I just reached a point where I couldn't read, and I had a real crisis. You know, I didn't find the teacher that I wanted, and I had two or three years when it was just really, I thought, oops, maybe chemistry should have been the <laughs> thing I did. But then I was very, very fortunate, and I had the chance to um, use some of the money which Glyndebourne offered me as a bursary to find a teacher, and I came to New York. Oh, you came to New York mm. for the teacher? I came to New York. And who was that teacher? And that teacher was Armin Boyajin, the teacher of, of course. Paul Plischke and Samuel Ramey. That's right. And I had to earn my place in his studio. He made me sweated out here. I came, flew over especially. He said, no, there's no commitments here. I, I have too many students. You'll have to, you know, slot in. I may be able to see you. So I was here for two weeks and on the 12th day, huh. he said, yes, I can see you tomorrow. So I went in and he sang and he said, all right, when are you coming back? Uh -huh. <laughs> I said, I'm leaving tomorrow. <laughs> he said, okay, well, look, you know, in a few months, let's try and see when it can be. So I established a a routine of coming to him, I guess once every six months, sometimes it was four months, and do about three intense lessons in about ten days. And I'd go back, and it was just like going to, I don't know, American football training, because right. he gave me some great exercises, and I felt myself grow, and just suddenly I had a voice again. So what was the first experience, at, like, you know, the first lesson with him? Oh, yeah, the first, ex he just said, okay, sing, ah. And I went, ah, he said, okay, I know where we're starting here. <laughs> and we started right on one pitch, trying to get the right position, trying to get the right sound. We spent the whole lesson on that, ah, uh, on an A flat. Mm. And we, and he's, and we, I think I nearly got it. And he said, okay, come back tomorrow. <laughs> and we'll, we'll stretch, we'll go from here. And I think I got to, I think I got to G and I got to A in the next Thing. So I started right in the middle and just stretched up one little bit and then down a little bit. Were you encouraged by that? I was so exhilarated. Oh. It felt right. It was one of those things where you think, oh my gosh, I've been waiting for this my whole life. I slept on a friend's floor he, he, nearby in Upper Manhattan and, uh, you know, couldn't, I could hardly sleep for excitement and then slept like a log because I was mm. so excited. <laughs> right. You know, and I had these, I did that for about three or four years. Uh, where he put my voice together. And he expanded it in both directions. Oh, absolutely. Gave me strength, gave me courage. and. So and, what was uh, the first thing after having this happen to you? What did you go off and sing? Well, I was lucky because then I was able to sing things like, well, my first real professional thing was Papageno, uh, which wasn't too great, but at least I had a voice to sing it with. Right. And from that, I got an agent. And from that, I then got asked to do uh, some other things, Papageno, and um, doing Mazzetto on a recording. I was asked to do Figaro in the Marriage of Figaro for the opening of Glyndebourne. Um, you know, at Guglielmo at Glyndebourne. So Glyndebourne was my kind of new Mozart, house. Mozart, and more Mozart. It seemed to be that's where I was going. Yes. And, Speaking uh, of Mozart, we happen to have a clip. Let's take a listen to, I believe this is the Count from Figaro. Could we listen to that? Terrific. Mozart, what, what is it about Mozart that's so great to sing? Well, I love the element of character in, in all the roles that he offers, the baritone particularly. Um, there's so much in the music, um, his response to Da Ponte's writing, particularly in, in the, obviously the three Da Ponte's are um, so sensitive and yet complex. Uh, I think he's in some ways a director's dream because he offers so many potentials uh, there's so much there's so many layers of emotion that you can find in each of the each of the characters I, I'm always thrilled to look at the score again 
and again and again and see something new and and look at you know why for instance in the counts are why he puts rests in between vedrò per man d'amore un italiano oggetto and it's just it's just the way you you'd be you'd be, you'd be breathless and, right. and full of anger and then then you just go like this and it's it, for me that's that's real i mean it's it's really easy to act <laughs> when you have so many clues like that. Of all the Mozart, which is the most satisfying evening to go through? Is there one that's more satisfying? Or are they hard to compare that way? Yeah, that, it's, it's hard. I mean, I love the music of Così very much. I, it, it's very therapeutic. I think in, anybody who's been through, um, you know, traumatic love... <laughs> And and questions of what love between humans is either either you know in a and well in all things either family or or relationships or whatever you know the the whole the pain of it and the balm of it uh, of the music I'm talking about you know that you 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 can be completely wrung out by cozy and its humor I mean I, that's the other thing about Mozart which I love is this 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 balance between the humor. And the pain, um, and the struggle that happens in the middle of that, and both sides are the, sort of the relaxing part, where you're either in pain or you're in hysterics, um, and then you journey into the struggle again and 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 find new new ways in and out. Um, but no, I think um, which one? What's the most satisfying evening? Gosh, it's usually the one I'm doing at the time. Exactly. I, speaking of humor, I, uh, watching you in this current run of Giovanni, it's great to see the uh, uh, the audience uh, uh, taking part so much and laughing so much. It's, yeah, they're having a great time with the text. Yeah, I hope that I hope that part of it is what we're doing on stage, and not too much with the surtitles. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to be a surtitle operator and just push the button at the right time for the actors is, uh, is, is a special skill. On yes. that note, it is time to take a break. Terrific. We're here with Gerald Finley today. This is Classic Talk with Bing and Dennis.